Hello, hello, hello to you this morning, this evening, this night, this midnight, this mid-morning, this noonday. We're looking now, we're beginning our series through um, the epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus. Um, this is a letter written by one who calls himself the disciple, which is what his name there means. Um, written to Diognetus. He explains here, opening, you can see on my screen, unless you're listening to the audio, then uh, it's free online, so you can access this anywhere. Free PDF. This is really old. <laughs> he says, see, so, sorry, since I see most excellent Diognetus, exceedingly desirous to learn the mode of worshiping God prevalent among the Christians and inquiring very carefully and earnestly concerning them, what God they trust in, and in what form of religion they observe, so as to look down upon the whole world itself and despise death, while they neither esteem those to be gods that are reckoned such by the Greeks, nor hold to the superstitions of the Jews, and with what is the affection which they cherish among themselves, and why in fine, you know, this is a run-on sentence, where he continues forth, and why in fine, this new kind of practice or piety, implore God, sorry, has now only entered into the world and not long ago, and we'll talk about that as well. That's super important. I cordially welcome in this thy desire, and I implore God who enables us both to speak and to hear, to grant, and so to speak, that above all I may hear you have been edified. So, of course, this Diognetus man, he is not a Christian. He's inquiring into Christianity. But I want you to note with Diognetus what um, our illustrious author, Mathetes, is trying to get across to him. When we talk about Christianity, we are talking about, uh, well, in the, in, the, uh, in the eyes, in the minds of the Holy Fathers, we are thinking of, first, the mode of worship, right? And there's, uh, I'm trying to remember which Lutheran theologian it was. Gee whiz, I can't remember. It is a red book about the Lutheran confessions. He's coming from a liberal perspective, but he says something that is so dang true that we have to high five him on it. And it is right on point. He nails it to the to the head or however that saying goes. He says, when people think of their religion, they think not firstly about the dogmas or the beliefs. They think firstly about the worshiping practices, right? He says, if one is thinking of a Roman Catholic, what are they thinking of? They are not thinking primarily of their understandings of justification. They are thinking primarily of the practices and the actions. Of course, they are thinking of the mass. They are thinking of the liturgies. They are thinking, though, also of the Hail Marys, of the intercessions of the saints, of the indulgences and the relics and the pilgrimages and so on. Whereas if you talk to the average Protestant about what distinguishes them from the Roman Catholics, they are not going to first think about the theology, but the theology as it's expressed through the liturgy, right, or the lack thereof. And this is the thing. This is what St. Prosper of Aquitaine said. It's not one or the other. It's both and through the one, right, through in this unified form. As you pray, so you believe. As you believe, so you pray, right? There's no idea of a divorced theology from a doxology or from a liturgy, right? Um, and this is something that I think a lot of newer Lutherans really struggle with when they're coming into the church. I know, I know it was uh, some, it was a big uh, issue for me to find that um, Lutheranism and, and let's say like reformed Calvinism, like true Geneva stuff, they are not cousins, they're not sisters or brothers, um, but that rather the churches that hold the common liturgy hold a common faith, right? That we're not saying, oh, we are together with the church in Geneva because they they speak similarly to us about how our works do not cause justification. Look, that's not enough, right? That if you're looking for the thing which carries the unity of the church, and I, I want to be careful here, of course, because uh, as we are very clear in the Oxford Confession, um, it is not the uh, external uh, unity of the liturgy and the rites of the church that form our essential unity, but it is in the broader scope of that liturgy that it, that it is, right? That is in 
yes, how the words are preached, but also how the sacraments are administered. And that includes the divine service. And that's why in our article on the mass, we say, yes, we keep the, we keep the mass religiously and we defend the mass. Again, this is not to say that um, because the Eastern Orthodox Church has a different liturgy than us, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, or the liturgies of the Orient, St. Basil, St. Gregory, St. Mark, are, or St. James of the Indians, the East Indians, that is, are invalid? No, that's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that liturgical churches roll together, right? And, <laughs> and they roll together because their faith is expressed in this kind of similarly incarnational sacramental way. And if you wanted to understand Christians this way, we talk about liturgical sacramental Christians or propositional, uh, I don't want to say Gnostic, but that's kind of what I mean, isn't it? Um, there are, is that kind of distinguishing line between these two groups. And so when he's talking about Christians and people thinking about Christians, where does he gravitate to first? He does not say, you know, uh, you are exceedingly desirous to learn the dogmatic beliefs of the Christians, right? Of course, he gets there shortly, but not even in those terms, right? He says the mode of worship. And this was a big, this was a big hot topic among the pagans in the world as well, as we'll see later on with uh, St. Justin Martyr, and as one might see in the letters of Pliny um, to Trajan, where the world around the church was super confused about why there was this group of people worshiping a man as God, and not just that, but claiming to eat his flesh and drink his blood. That was bizarre to them, right? And the fact also that they did not worship other gods. They did not accept the existence of other gods. And so, but all of this is coming back down to worship because what was the sign in the ancient world that you believed in a god? And this, again, you know, I've been harping on them for a few episodes now. I'm going to do it again. These weird insta instagelicals, these evangelicals, these new wave of evangelicals who don't go to church and never have. How in the ancient world, so as to this world, how do you prove, how do you, how is the, how is you, how are you going to substantiate the fact that you believe in a God? You will worship that God. And how do you worship that God? You worship that God through the liturgy, right? Not through a means of your own making, but primarily through the ecclesia, the gathering together around word preached and eaten in sacrament. So he says there, not just this worship though, right? But inquiring very carefully and earnestly concerning them, what God they trust in. This is the faith, right? What is this God of the Christians? Is he a man? Is he a God? Is he three gods? What are we talking about exactly? And the form of religion that they observe. So how does that whole religion form itself into a concrete practice? So as to look down on the world and despise death. And this was very interesting as well to the ancient world. Why is it that all of these Christians are taking care of discarded babies and feeding orphans and, and widows and housing homeless people. They are not acting like normal human beings. Um, and why is it that they do not fear death, right? What's going on here? So then, of course, he speaks of the great love that they have for everybody within the church, the affection that they cherish among themselves. So this is what Amathetes is going to be delivering to our friend Diognetus. So come then, he says, after you freed yourself from all prejudices and put, that have been possessing your mind and laid aside what you've been accustomed to as something apt to deceive you and being made as if it were from the beginning a new man, right? This He's talking about not just laying aside your prejudices. This is getting really close to conversion, becoming a new man, right? In as much as according to your own confession, you're the hero of a new system of doctrine, a new system of doctrine. Come and contemplate, not with your eyes only, that is the eyes of the flesh, right? But with your understanding, the substance and the form of those whom you declare and deem to be gods. It is not one of them of stone, similar to one we tread, right? It is not a second brass, in no way superior to those vessels which are constructed for our ordinary use. What's he doing? He's cutting right to the jugular immediately. He's saying, look, you uh, you want to know about our gods? Let's talk about your gods first, <laughs> right? And so what's funny here is that uh, um, he says, lay aside your prejudices. And I don't mean to harp on uh, Mathetes, but uh, he says, um, 
lay aside your prejudices. And then he goes and he picks up his own prejudices, right? He says, I, you know, this is maybe fair to do, though, in another sense, right? Because in the ancient world, these gods were taken for granted. Nobody was questioning these gods, not even the Jews. The Jews didn't worship the gods, but they weren't exactly proselytizing the Gentiles at all in the way that they really should have been doing. And so what instead was happening was you have these people who have never th have never thought to think about why they worship brass, stone, wood, silver, whatever, right? And so now you have these Christians coming along, and he's saying, "Think about this." You, you, he says right here. Look at these words. Of course, if you're just listening, I'll read them to you. But look, look right here, right? This sums up his whole argument. Are not all these corruptible matter, right? Cannot these be stolen, right? These, like, how can these be God if you fashion them yourself? Of course, this is not being entirely fair to the pagans because the pagans did believe that these things were then inhabited by their gods as a sort of, uh, as a sort of, what, what could you say, um, vessel or a sort of a connection uh, point to those gods. But yet the matter remains, right? If it were not for you making this silly idol out of uh, stone, wood, brass, whatever, you would have no, you would have no avatar for your gods right? And then he says of this, well, you know, these things you formed, they can't hear, they can't see. Are they not deaf? Are they not blind? Are they not without life, right? Again, not being entirely fair to the pagans. These pagans did believe, right, that there was a spiritual god that would then inhabit and use this, this, this physical idol that was formed. But again, coming back to this, to this, uh, to this Christian question, if it is so, that these pagan gods need you to make for them a little idol so that they can inhabit it and relate with you, and relate to you. It is not the God revealing himself to you. It is not the God uh, making himself present to you. It's you making the God present to you. It's you asking the God to be present to you. It's you, it, honestly, it's you bringing that God into the world, right? Which means he's not in the world, which means he is not a God, right? And so he says, you know, you, these gods... You know, let me just sum up his whole argument. These aren't gods. And you know that they're not gods because you made them, right? So he says then, and next I imagine that you are most desirous of hearing something on this point, that the Christians do not observe the same forms of divine worship as do the Jews. And this is true and this is interesting, but this is extremely important because of how early this text is being written. See, it's said all the time that... Um, the Christians maintained worship in the synagogue with the Jews and that they basically were Jews. And, you know, you know who loves these arguments? Um, the Messianic Jews and the Jews for Jesus people and the evangelicals and the Pentecostals and the whoever's, right, who reject the liturgy of the church and want to go back to the liturgy of the Jew, who reject the feast day of the Christian and go back to the feast day of the Jew, who, you know, and is it is it Christianity that they want or is it is it um, uh uh, a Judaism, but one that accepts Jesus, right? They, 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 on Maundy Thursday, replace the Lord's Supper on its institution with the Passover Seder, which it's supposed to fulfill, right? All of these, all of these kinds of things are uh, wrong, and they are done on the basis of an assumption that's wrong. And that assumption is early Christians worship like the Jews. Mathete says to us, uh, you you have heard something, and it is this, right? The Christians do not observe the same forms of worship as do the Jews. The Jews, then, if they abstain from the same kind of service as observed and deem it proper to worship one God as being Lord of all, are right. But if they offer him worship in the way which we have described, they greatly err. For while Gentiles, by offering such things to those as are destitute of sense and hearing, furnish an example of madness. They, on the other hand, by thinking off of these things to God as if he needed them, might justly reckon it rather on acts of folly than divine worship. So, of course, this is in regard to the fact that the Jews do not um, worship the uh, the pagans, and they are right in doing so. But the worship of the Jews is false. And why is the worship of the Jews false? The worship of the Jews is false because they do not accept the Messiah. Right? He says here of the Jews, but those who imagine that by means of blood, this is of the animals, right? And this goes back to that old issue of like, 
uh, replacing the Lord's Supper, which is the fulfillment of the Passover, with the shadow of the fullness, the Passover itself. Such as to say, I don't believe that the death of God can redeem my sins. I'm going to keep sacrificing poles. He calls this the superstition of the Jews. But those who imagine that by means of blood and the smoke of sacrifices and burnt offerings, they offer sacrifices acceptable to him, and that by such honors they show him respect, these, by supporting that they can give anything to him who stands in need of nothing, appear to me in no respect to differ from those who studiously confer the same honor on things destitute of sense, which therefore are unable to enjoy such honors. And I want to also drag this into Christians who go to Mass thinking that they go to give something to God, to give something to God. And I ask my own uh, congregation this all the time, why are you here this morning? Why do we gather for divine service? And what does that mean? Right? What are we doing here, guys? And the thing that I hear all the time, you know, I come to, you know, I've trained my congregation out of this, but I used to hear all the time, and I still hear from other people, I come to give, I come to offer. And people say, I used to go to church, if, like evangelicals love to say this, I used to go to church to get something out of it. But then I learned when I became a mature Christian, that I go to give something. That's not true. Right? Let me tell you what's true. Uh, just as Matthew is saying, if you are going to church or approaching God or approaching the Christian religion, approaching Yahweh as as one that you give unto. He says you are, you are trying to make your religion about giving to uh, a, a being which needs nothing, but which gives all things and creates all things. You are doing the same thing as one who feeds a pagan idol, of one who speaks prayers into something that has no ears and cannot hear, uh, one who uh, offers worship to an inanimate object, right? Uh, because the Lord God needs nothing from you. And so you are engaging not only in this kind of um this kind of um superstition, but you are rejecting the thing he's given you, right? And this is what happens when Jews offer sacrifices instead of believing in the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But this also happens with Christians, right? When we think that we are forming our own justification through our works, through our worships, um, no, right? No. Uh, rather, we come to these things to receive from the hand of the God who gives. Right now, he says of the uh, Jews again, but as to their scrupulosity concerning meats, right? This is their food laws and their supersist superstition as respects the Sabbaths. And, and you know, uh, maybe we need to stop here for just a second, right? Their fancies about fastings and new moons, which are utterly ridiculous and unworthy of notice. Pause there. Um, the reform need to hear this, and the Roman Catholics need to hear this, and a bunch of other people need to hear this. Uh, the thing is. Um, the early church is not Sabbatarian. Christians are not supposed to be Sabbatarian. Hear now the teacher of the disciples. The disciple himself, Mathetes, as he writes to Diognetus. Now, another thing of the superstition of the Jews, he says, is their obsession with these Sabbaths. Their obsession, and what's the what's the ridiculousness of the obsession with Sabbath? It's the same as with the sacrifices, right? They have replaced the fullness with the shadow. The, the fullness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the animals. Uh, Sorry, that's the shadow. The fullness of is, is Jesus himself. They have replaced Jesus. They've rejected that. They want to go back to the shadow. The same thing with the Eucharist and the Passover. The same thing with the Sabbath and, and, the, and the rest eternal that we have in Jesus Christ. The same, you know, with all of these things, with all of these things, with the circumcision also, because they reject baptism, but they want the circumcision. They want the, the, the type, but not the anti-type. They want the foreshadow, but not the fullness. They want, you know, they want this, but not the real reality. Their fancies about fasting. Now, what? It, yeah, again, there's again other churches that we can we can try to get to pay attention to this. Their obsessions are always with the external, right? They are not with the spiritual. They are not with the full. They are not with the fulfilled. They are not with the Messiah who's come, but their own works, right? Uh, who? I'm not going to say who this reminds me of, but you know, which are utterly ridiculous and unworthy of notice. Now, this this is the thing, right? Lutherans are not against fasting, but you will find. Uh, all across the Book of Concord, exactly the voice of Mathetes, right? All these things of Sabbaths, all these things of circumcision, all these things of fastings, all these things of new moons and feasts, right? That's what that's about, holidays. This obsession with the externalities, this obsession with the with the uh, the 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 uh, dangly bits, with the uh, ordain or uh, what what's that? Ornaments, ornamentalities of the religion. 
rather than the essence, it's utterly ridiculous and unworthy of notice. And it's superstition, right? And I hear this from so many, uh, you know, Roman Catholics and the Orthodox is who it is, right? Uh, oh, I didn't fast properly. I can't take communion. Look, that's not how it works, right? Or, <laughs> or um, you know, I, uh, I, I can't be baptized because I didn't fast three days ahead of, look, that's not how it works, right? These, and, you know, the crazy fasting rules uh, that they have is so bizarre to me, so light. It's not fasting to me. It's very crazy to me. And, you know, sometimes it just makes me feel like um, a roundabout way of getting so into the externalities that you end up externalizing themselves from themselves. And so it becomes all about the external act of fasting to the point that you, 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 you whittle this down to um, not actually fasting, not actually giving anything up, but just distinguishing between meats right? I can eat the fish, but I can't eat the, the beef. I can, you know, can I eat the chicken? Who knows, right? <laughs> and what days can you do that? And what days can you drink wine? And what days can you have olive oil in your food, you know? So he says, I do not think that you require to learn anything from me for to accept some of those things which have been formed by God for use of men as properly formed and to reject others as useless and redundant. How can this be lawful? It can't be lawful. And to speak falsely of God, as if he forbade to do that, which is good on the Sabbath days, how is that not impious, right? So he's doing a really extreme theological turn. He is saying to call, and this, we have this in the gospel, right? Where, um, or uh, sorry, in the book of Acts, right? Where Peter uh, has that vision of the mat, the, the rug handed down with all of the meats. And then the Lord God says, you know, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, how can I, you know, I've, I've in my whole life, I've never eaten any unclean meat. And he says, how, you know, how dare you call what I have called clean, unclean. So Matthew is doing the same thing, right? You are making a distinguishment, not just with food, but also with raiment, also with other people, with Gentiles. And he's saying, you, you're calling something formed by God, which is holy and perfect in itself because of God made holy by the blessing of God and by prayer, right? And by faith. And you are calling it dirty. This can't be lawful because it's an insult to God's creation and an insult to faith and an insult to God's blessing. And to speak falsely of God as if he forbade to do what's good on the Sabbath. This is because the, the Sabbath is fulfilled. This is what Peter, uh, sorry, St. Paul says, right? This thing of the Sabbath, let no man judge you in matters of food, in matters of Sabbath, in matters of new moons and festivals, right? Again, uh, how can you forbid to do uh, what's good on the Sabbath when God is not? You can also apply this to the Pharisees accosting Jesus about this, right? When he heals on the Sabbath and they get all up in arms and he says, well, tell me, is it good to to heal or to kill on the Sabbath, to do good on the Sabbath or to, to do ill on the Sabbath? It's a good question to ask, right? And this you can apply here also. When we look at when we look at the idea of Sabbath, of course, we know as Christians, our Sabbath is not one day out of the week, but every day of the week. Our Sabbath is not found in our not working and our not buying and our not selling, but in our believing in Jesus Christ and resting in that assurance that we have in him. And he says, and, and to glory in the circumcision of the flesh as a proof of election, as if on account of it, they were specifically loved by God. How is it not to subject a subject of ridicule, and indeed it is, and we see this in the gospel, right? A Jew is not one inwardly, but one, sorry, not one outwardly, but one who is one inwardly. We see also uh, um, from St. John the Baptist, he says, you know of this, um, you boast in your ethnicity and your genes. Uh, God can raise up from these stones, even a children of Abraham. And so do not rest in that, right? You have to rest in your faith in Christ, and that is all, right? The work of God in Christ for you. That is all, right? But this idea that you would boast in the fact that you cut the tip of your phallus off, well, that's not going to help you. That doesn't mean that you're elect. Um, you know what means that you're elect is, you know, <laughs> not that, right? It's going to be your faith, right? In Jesus Christ. It's going to be the work of, of God in Jesus Christ for you and your reception of that and living into that. He says, as to their observing months and days as if waiting upon the stars and the moon and distributing uh, they're distributing according to their own tendencies, the appointments of God, the vicissitude of seasons, some for festivities, some for mourning. Who would deem this a part of divine worship, right? And not much rather a manifestation of folly. Now, we have to be uh, kind of careful here uh, with this um, because now, you know, Mathetes did not have this, but we have this huge kind of calendar, this church calendar, and I'm not knocking it. I love it. Everyone knows I'm, I, I absolutely adore it, but um you know, his point is this, and it applies to the Christian uh, sanctoral cycle as well. 
to set apart, for example, Good Friday for uh, mourning, um, for setting apart Ash Wednesday for remembering that we're going to die, you know, setting apart uh, Christmas for remembering the birth and the life of Jesus Christ coming into the world. These are not things that we should really be doing, right? Of course, it's necessary to have these things so that these things are preached, but these things ought to be preached and thought about constantly. This is his point, right? This is his point. Such as when someone says, for example, how dare you? And, you know, and I don't mean get rid of the lectionary or anything, but I mean, like, if we're not on, if we're on Christmas preaching the cross, this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If we are uh, preaching the death of Christ on Easter and the resurrection of Christ on Good Friday, oh, no, lock us up, right? Hey, you know, and this is what he's saying, right? This is a manifestation of folly. I suppose then. You're sufficiently convinced that the Christians properly abstain from the vanity and error common both to Jews and Gentiles and from the busybody spirit and vain boasting of the Jews. But you must not hope to learn the mystery of their peculiar mode of worshiping from any mortal, right? For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country nor language, nor by the customs they observe. Now, this is almost straight out of the Oxford Confession, right? Um, again, our unity is not found in these external things. Our unity is found in the preaching of God's word and the administration of the holy sacraments. And this is the thing. We are not a national religion. We are not an ethnic religion, you know, to the surprise maybe of the Orthodox who haven't learned that, right? Um, rather, we are a universal Catholic religion. We are a religion for all men, all women, all children of every kind, of every shape, of every size, right? We're unified not by our ethnicity, not by our culture, not by our tradition or our upbringing. We're unified by the love of God for us in Jesus Christ and our faith and practice of that, right? They neither inhabit cities of their own. This is true. We have no cities of our own. And this, again, this is straight out of the Augsburg Confession. We do not accept this idea of, uh, of what we call, you know, uh, Jewish fancies and follies, fantasies of the Lord God setting up this kingdom on earth as he did in the old testament this is not what we look for right what rather we inhabit the kingdom of god which is not of this world he says here we do not employ a peculiar form of speech nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity the course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by a speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men nor do they like some proclaim the advocates of any merely human human doctrines, but inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities. That is, we are everywhere. We speak every language. We have every culture. We are from every kind, of every stripe, of every walk of human life. And everywhere you look, you will find Christians confessing the love of God. Of And, and the thing is, he is the God of all men. And he is the God who has saved all men. He is the God who is for all men. And that's our proclamation, right? And he says, we do not all share one way of life. We have many ways of life. We do not share one language, but many. We do not share one city, but all of them, right? They dwell in their own countries, but simply are sojourners. Uh, as citizens, they share in all things with others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them their native country and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry as do all others. They beget children. They do not destroy offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed, right? Uh, again, what's he saying? We are like, you know, we are like all of these people. We are universal, but he's qualifying this, right? He's saying, you know, this this land that we were born in, we do not, we do not stick there. Uh, we go around. Why? Because we are fulfilling the mission of Jesus Christ, preaching the kingdom of God to all people. We do have a common table and all are welcome. Not, not the Eucharistic table, but Everybody, we will feed all people, but rather we will not sleep with all people, right? Some things are holy for us, uh, such as marriage. They are in the flesh, but do not live after the flesh, right? We are we are in the world, but we are not of the world. They pass days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives, right? We are beyond. We, we are not just citizens. We are super citizens, right? And I don't want to say dual citizens, um, but rather... Um, this is a, a, a kind of sojourn, uh, and the laws that we obey, we don't obey them, we surpass them, 
right? They love all men and are persecuted by all men. What is this? They love those who persecute them. They forgive those who hurt them. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor and yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are spoken evil of and yet are justified. They are reviled and yet they bless. They are insulted and yet repay the insult with honor. They do good and yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as quickened to life. They they are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are unable to find any reason for their hatred. These are who the Christians are. And so, of course, Diognetus is like, well, who are these people? What is what is motivating them to live this ridiculously absurd kind of kind of life? And and you know what the thing is? You you read the 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 lifestyle that Mathetes is describing. My goodness, this is unbelievable. And this is this is a kind of life that's marked by the divine love of God in Jesus Christ, right? That's what it is, and and it's one that's that's marked by this kind of this this hope, marked by this, well, what we might call as Christians the gospel of reversal. Notice this, right? Um, all men persecute us, and what is the way of the world going to tell us about that? That we should lash out again? That we should we should we should um, go pound for pound? That we should go hit for hit, shot for shot, take our pound of flesh, um, get revenge? No, that's not our way, right? We find this in the Lord's Beatitudes. What he's saying is really from the Beatitudes. Notice this, right? Um, they do good. They're punished for good. But uh, when they're persecuted, um, they are blessed. Uh, moreover, uh, they are, you know, uh, this is from the scriptures, but applied in his own words. Like he knows what he's talking about. And what he's talking about, again, it's that it's that unbelievable paradoxical gospel of reversal. You can put us to death and yet we believe we live all the more. You can persecute us and yet we believe we get the crown. You can kill us and we believe we get the victory. This is nuts. This is insane. This is the Christian religion. And you can you can hear, right? If if you if you are somebody who is who is a slave, that like this is the religion for you. If you are somebody in and it's not to say because this is often this is often said as a bad thing, and I don't even see why. I think it's because people uh, are are so full of themselves and they're uh, evil and probably possessed. But they say like Christianity is a, re a religion for broken people, a religion for hurting people, a religion for stupid people who are low down on their luck. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? That's an amazing thing. Let me say it to you this way: uh, the Christian religion is the religion for the people who have no hope. Uh, if if you are if you you know when you get the I say it all the time, right? When you get the cancer diagnosis, when you're dying you need hope where are you going to find it we're the ones who can give it to you um and that's not a salesman uh thing to say that's just the the absolute reality this is a religion of a hope and a joy and a, a peace that surpasses all understanding all circumstances and makes no sense within context right uh, this is the religion whereby um its adherents uh are believe that they are most blessed when you kill them that they are most happy when you persecute them that um even in death yet they shall live that you know and it, it's nuts right that they will forgive and they will love those who persecute and hate and harm them and so, the, you know, Dionysus looks at this and he's like, tell me about this. Tell me about this. And this is really the way that, that you know, you hear the thing that uh, is attributed wrongly to St. Francis all the time. Preach the gospel, use words as, as if necessary. Now, and I hate that because words are always necessary. But it is true, right? The, the life of love lived in witness uh, is, a, is, is, is a testimony to the world of uh, the work of God, the love of God alive in his church and the individuals in his church. And it's a beautiful thing. And um, it's when people see that, when people see that, when they get a taste of that through Christians, um, God's love is made known to them through the Christians that they know. And they start to ask questions. Tell me about your God. Tell me about the joy. Tell me about the, the tell me about the thing that is, that is, that is your reason for this joy. And that's how St. Peter says it, right? And he says, to sum it up all in one word, what the soul is in the body that are the Christians in the world. This is, you know, some of the lines in his epistle to Diognetus are just such absolute outright bangers. Um, this, what's he saying? He's, you know, you have to go back to Genesis uh, 2 to see what he's saying here. Um, what he's saying is just as Adam is formed from the dust and not a living body until the father breathes through his nostrils to breathe the breath of life into him. So the Christian is in the world. The world is dead. The world is dark. The world is uh, asleep, and we invigorate it. We we breathe life into it. We uh, and this is the thing. We we animate 
That's what it means. Anima, the anima, the soul. We animate the world. We give life to the world. This is, a, you know, salt and light. Where does the light come from? Oh, it comes from the Christians in the world. And this is something, you know, the Catholic Church, they say something. They say, and of course, I don't, you know, I think we should we should take this a little out of the way it was meant. But, you know, they say if, if masses were no longer offered, then um, the world would just cease to exist. It would just be destroyed. I'm going to, you know, we need to tweak that a little bit. But the reality is if there are no Christians in the world living, witnessing, loving, testifying, um, the world will have no life uh, because we are its life. We are its life because we breathe the life, the animating spirit of God into the world, which gives life to all things. And so he says the soul is dispersed through all the members of the body and Christians are scattered through all the cities of the world. The soul dwells in the body, yet it is not of the body. And the Christians dwell in the world, yet are not of the world. The invisible soul is guarded by the visible body. And Christians are known indeed in the world, but their godliness remains invisible. The flesh hates the soul and wars against it. And though itself suffering no injury because it's prevented from enjoying the pleasures, the world also hates the Christians, though in no wise injures them because they abjure pleasures the soul loves the flesh that hates it and loves also the members the christians likewise love those that hate them again this is like he's he's applying he's applying the the christ principles the the beatitude principles through this but in his own words and in the most beautiful most poetic kinds of ways um um the soul he says imprisoned in the body this is a platonic understanding he's playing on on the philosophy of diognetus and the world around him the christians are confused find us in a prison and yet they are the preservers of the world the immortal soul dwells in a mortal tabernacle and christians dwell as sojourners in corruptible bodies looking for incorruptible dwelling in the heavens the soul then subjected day by day to punishment increases the more in number god has assigned them this illustrious position which it were lawful unlawful for them rather to forsake so what is he saying um you you see these Christians, they are not just unique in the world. They're not just different in the world. They are necessary for the life of the world. They are the life of the world. So, okay, we're going to stop there, pause there. Uh, we're about halfway through. Uh, next time, uh, we're going to finish this up because uh, it's not that long. So we are, what, six chapters in, and there are exactly 12 chapters to the book. So there you go. I hope you're enjoying um, the epistle to Diognetus. And, you know, what's he? what's he really saying? Uh, the Christian church is unique in the world. The Christian church is unique in the world and life giving to the world because it does it does the things of the Beatitudes, because it lives the Sermon on the Mount. And through living the Sermon on the Mount, through witnessing of Christ and his love, we give life to the world. This is it. It's all about being salt and light, if you will. So I hope that blesses you, encourages you, uh, intrigues you. And uh, I'll be with you again next week. God bless you.